the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha, I am geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea and Mauna Loa volcano update today, Thursday, June 10th, 2021. Starting off, you guys, with a view here from our new camera from the USGS uh, that is on Mauna Kea, looking south towards Mauna Loa, looking at that north slope. And start off talking about Mauna Loa today. Uh, we will then uh, transition to Kilauea, looking at the data first of 2021 and a little bit of what happened last year. We'll stop and take some questions, and then we'll talk about 2018 a little bit after that, and a little bit of the research that's that's been published recently uh, that we have not reviewed yet about 2018. So um, thanks for joining us. Uh, submit your questions to Dane. He'll address what he can in the chats online. He'll monitor our streams, make sure things are right. Let us know if there are any issues. He'll pass that along to me, and we will. Um, get into it here and look forward to discussing with you guys some of the topics you guys are interested in here um, after we present what is happening with the volcanoes today. And in summary, it's been pretty quiet on the surface of both volcanoes, uh, but there is signs of life underground. Mauna Loa here, we'll start off with this pretty webcam view. This is the last 24 hours looking, looking to the south. And the USGS has released this annotated image here that I will zoom into so you can read it a little more easily here. You can see down here, this is a, a transmitter part on Mauna Kea facility here. But so behind it is what we're looking at, Mauna Loa Shield Volcano, and the summit's up here. And you can maybe see a little bit of this notch right in here. Oh, 
uh, I'll exaggerate it there. A little bit of a notch right in there. That's that summit caldera area at the summit right in there. Otherwise, you see mostly the northeast rift zone. The southwest rift zone is a little bit behind over the horizon this way, but you do see this north flank over here towards Hualalai. And then looking over to the left of the image, here it is. You could actually, at the very far side here, see part of Kilauea, Halemaumau with a summit visible. Mana Ulu in a far distant background, Kanani Yohamo, Lava Shield, Lava Shield, Summit Crater here. And of course, also a little cinder cone of Kulani that's a part of Mauna Loa's northeast flank here. That's, that's the newest image we have. And this is something Dana's posted about in HawaiiTracker.com. So if you guys are watching the website, you guys are not surprised by this. And this is part of a deployment the USGS has announced back in 2020. And, uh, not quite a year ago, to expand not just um, Kilauea's webcams across the Lower East Rift Zone and Upper East Rift Zone to areas that are not covered, but also to look at other parts of Mauna Loa, um, especially this north side. And the idea being to be able to cover all of the lava hazard zones one and two, um, especially that are uh, zone one, especially that's that's the side of this eruption uh, on both volcanoes here. So I'll we'll just refer you guys to this back over here. It's linked in Dane's article if you want to see more about it. I will I will leave it there. And move on and just show you guys the summary of what there is in Mauna Loa now. So we have here the Summit Caldera, the ML cam, or Caldera view from the north. Thermal image similar to there. And very low temperatures on a scale here. So it's really it shows differences in colors, but the very very low range of scale here. So nothing volcanic happening up there. It does note sometimes you do see fume and you do see steam in some of the cracks, especially in the early morning hours. There is the MO cam, which is on the south rim. And it looks like it might have just gone offline a couple of days ago uh, in the middle of the night, showing a black image here. But it is often online here. The, um, looking at that uh, south rim, um, looking back towards the north, right where you can see the 1940 cone, 1949 cone in the upper, upper rim. SP cam up oh, look looks, looks like it's gone black too, and then of course here's a Mount Akea camera. We have the one from the Kilauea summit, looking from the south, the opposite point of view from Mount Akea here, and there's southwest rift zone cameras, middle, upper as well up there. I won't spend much time on those. Just to review, there's quite a lot of cameras, and given the announcement of the deployment of this webcam 2.0 coverage, we probably should expect more coming in the months and and the years ahead. So moving on from there, let's look at what's actually happening in Mauna Loa signal-wise. And so here's our tilt and GPS deformation data. And looking at the tilt, we can see here our, our diurnal cycle with daily peaks, possibly temperature-driven from sun or, you know, who knows exactly what that is, but it seems to be coming in once a day or so right in there. We look at the past month and we see that there's some other wiggles on this graph as well. And maybe something you see some little bit of oscillation going something like that we'll look at that here shortly as well but let me move on and you know just for now know that it's not very big there either and we can go down here to the gps and look at the gps cross caldera distance and let me zoom into it to the right end of the graph here because this is a year-long plot and so we're looking at just what's happened in the last few months it's this right part of the graph here and not a lot of change really it's been fairly consistent here, and if it's changing, it's not changing very fast. So Mauna Loa is still a neutral per se. Uh, it does seem to be filling and moving underground. There are still earthquakes happening. You know, these volcanoes never go quite to zero. So um, it is still coasting along, and there are there is evidence of life in there, but it's not actively moving its flanks like it was before, especially as we were covering it a few months ago here in March. So. Um, because I wanted to add a little bit more about Mauna Loa, there's not a whole lot of Mauna Loa happening here. I just wanted to show you guys some of these variations that we see here. So here's our, our tilt signal, and as I pointed out, this variation is sl slow cycle here. And so not only do you have possible daily variations, you can also have uh, variations from um, the, the, the neap and the spring tides as well. So what I've done here is I've pulled up on a NOAA site here, this is for Hilo, looking at the tidal ranges. Um, for the last month or so, right? So you can see that you have a bigger tidal range. This is our, our spring tide right here. And here's our neap tide right in there. And here's our spring tide again that falls around a 26 or so. And our neap tide comes in at the beginning of June right in there. 
So that's, in fact, very similar to this pattern we're seeing here, right? And it's interesting because we're actually, um, we're, we're not, we're, you know, we're, we're, we are not at a point where, where the tidal effect is at its largest over the course of the year, but we're still seeing this effect. You can see it's, it's very minor. It's a fraction of a microrigging here, but just to show that these forces do have influences and people often ask, you know, can, can planetary bodies have effect on the volcanoes? And we can clearly measure that there are forces happening here, right? But you can see the magnitude is not as big as some of the volcanic forces. And so we often say that if it's a hair trigger ready to go, then this might be something that sets it off. But these are the kind of events that happen every single day. And so at that point, literally anything can set it off. So that's why we often, often don't say, well, it was because of this or because of that, but really at, at its root cause, the volcano here. So just a little insight there into that, into that tidal pattern. And if you need a little quick refresher here, there's a NOAA diagram right there, sun over here, earth, moon is either aligned with the sun, where you can have the building effect of the tides, or it could be at 90 degrees where you have them working against each other. Right, that's the neap tide, and this is a spring tide. So a bigger variation in spring tide than a neap tide, and that's essentially what you can see in these longer-term signals on on a solid Earth, in fact, as well. So that's that's an interesting correlation that appears to be there. But sticking to volcanoes here, let's make sure we cover our bases with USGS and the most re recent weekly update this morning. Um, noted 60 small magnitude earthquakes. That's about the same as last week, and it's relatively low compared to what we've seen in, in previous months. And it does note that there was one that was a magnitude 3.2 that occurred 0.8 miles above sea level below the summit. Everything else was less than that. So that was on June 8th. Otherwise, low GPS, low gas, no other sign signals of activity on Mauna Loa. They do note that 3.2 earthquake, though. So that might be the most interesting th thing there is. Not a whole lot of activity. Here's a past week of earthquakes on Mauna Loa. And there is that 3.2 right in there, and there's that upper southwest rift summit area. And you can see that, you know, we've seen this activity before, so clearly there's still magma coming in, it's still adjusting, it's certainly not a dead volcano by any means, no one's suggesting that, of course. Um, but there is that sign of life, even though we're not seeing the GPS move. Not a whole lot of, of data really there to, to say much more about. Um, that is the earthquake pattern. So we can look at the, the trends of earthquakes here over the past year, and we can see that here we are at the right end of the year, and we're still at pretty low levels, right? And we haven't had full time. We've got to ignore this very rightmost bar because it's not a, not a full week being measured here yet. But you can see all the previous ones have been a lot less the last five or so than the previous five. Overall, uh, really have, have coasted into neutral here. So that is Mauna Loa. We'll look at the earthquakes on the, the island scale here. So this is the Iris Earthquake Browser once again. And now I have it set up, set up to go from the beginning of June over here. So this is the last 10 days or so. And Mauna Loa, I can look at Mauna Loa first. Zoom in a little bit here. And there is that one earthquake and another one here. And you get a couple over here and over here. And that's just about it. Really not a whole lot to talk about there. There is a little cluster that occurred last week at Loihi that we discussed. There it is down there appearing. And otherwise, most of the action is on Kilauea. So we will turn our attention to Kilauea's monitoring signal now. Using this earthquake map as a bridge here. And let's zoom in on Kilauea. And over the last 10 days, you can see here that there's been activity under the summit. And in a pretty straight line here, underneath this upper east rift connector. Right in there. Zoom it in some more, perhaps. So this is the, the chain of craters road in the National Park comes down in this direction, right? Following the craters that mark this upper east rift, upper east rift connector area. So just as it was a case back in November of 2020, um, we have earthquakes not only in a summit, but a connected uh, extension that comes off here to the upper east rift that we've been pointing out for a while now. We're not really seeing a whole lot in the southwest rift, maybe a little bit of a cluster right in here, but that's not necessarily outside the summit pocket per se. So really nothing convincing the southwest rift, but clearly this the magma reservoir is open that far at the very least. If I scroll it over a little bit over here, let's get pool oil on the side over here, we can compare it to what's happening a little bit further east. And not a whole lot on this map showing over here. 
but there are a few earthquakes starting to pop up in this region in here as well. So it could be that this pressure is migrating its way around, and if it keeps building at some point, that wouldn't be a surprise. And that was what happened before, where the magma built pressure all the way to right in here. And it still appears that there's some block in this area. We'll look at this to make sure that the signals are still showing us this, but um, cut to the chase, yeah, there's no evidence that there's no that there's a, any opening that the, that block is is compromised still. So wouldn't be surprising to see this move to over here, and that's all normal, and that shouldn't be surprising or alarming to any of us. And only if it starts moving beyond that, once again, will we, will we uh, have to consider how far might it go and what kind of alerts can we put out and essentially begin higher watch at that point. But for now, everything's in a national park. There is no hazard to habitation or anything like that, and not expected to be. All right, I just uh, make sure I cover that base because I, and I know that we've been out in the community talking to a lot of people and people are still concerned about the volcano of course so um naturally so the trauma of 2018 is going to last for a while and not only is the, the 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 science advancing right with synthesizing everything that's happened from 2018 and getting published but we're also processing and um putting out new compilations dane's drone on series that we're, we'll talk about later as well all of that is is part of our process of of simulating what happened in 2018. That's the that upper east rift. Let's look, look at a different view of this. Let me, let me pause this animation here. So, and let's switch to the USGS um, plots here. So, over the past year in Kilauea, you can see here that we've had a little bit of an increase in the past month or so. Um, our most recent week, the very right side here, not quite as as prominent, of course. But you can see that previous to the eruption. We are at much higher levels, so we're not anywhere near that quite yet. You can see we're starting to get, these two peaks are getting in a range of there, right? But we're not seeing that sustained yet. So that'll be interesting to see is if we come back to a sustained level, that may be what's the, the beginning of what we're seeing here. We may see this being ramping up to go back to this, this level. In fact, we do see signs in the volcano of pressure still coming in and building. That's what the earthquakes are telling us. And, uh, if it can sustain at that similar rate, you know, you, you, you could say at soonest it might be a matter of weeks, but it could be a matter of months before it pops out again or something's forced to, to adjust again, whether it's underground or coming to the surface as an eruption. We will only have to wait and see. So this is the past year. Let's zoom in here to the past month on the right side. Right button. It's the past month, so here's that increase that we saw right in there. You can see it's dropped off a little bit, so it's not been consistent yet, but as we know, these earthquake patterns, depending on what your bucket is, and per day, or per week, or two or three days, and it really changes how the, the bumpiness of the graph actually looks. We're looking for more of the average background baseline here. Um, you could argue that the baseline early, lower than the baseline later, slightly here. It's not, not like the baseline's up here quite yet. This is the, the maximum value. So that's the past month, and let's the on on the USGS map that looks at uh, even smaller events than the ones shown on that Iris Earthquake browser, right? And then that was only ten days. This is a whole month now. I will zoom it in here, so you really can see this pattern starting to build. It's been today is June tenth. Uh, we we believe that it was uh, May eleventh to thirteenth was the last injection of lava, last intrusion of lava into the summit eruption of Kilauea. So it's been almost a full month without the magma coming out. And so now I feel it's more appropriate to look at this full month plot as, as indicative of its own era here. So really you can see this cluster of summit earthquakes. And there is that East Rift connector quite visible right in there. And of course you also can see here a lot of the south flank activity down in here, all through here. And it may well be that this big earthquake, uh, I forget now if it was a 4.2 or a 4.0 or four point something in here. Maybe that when this thing moved, this whole triangle of the south flank here that exists was able to move seaward, perhaps, or even if it's just this right half of it here. It's able to move seaward as a result of that earthquake, and that could be possibly allowing this connectivity to stay established right now through there. And it may in fact allow it to round the corner a little bit and this map of the past month you see a little bit over here 
And as far as some of these earthquakes getting close to pool, if I scroll it farther over, you can see that on the rift itself, you don't see a whole lot. Here's pool. You don't see a whole lot on the rift past pool right through there. But you are seeing the south flank still adjusting a little bit more further down, as we have noted last week as well. South flank is still moving there. And if I scroll it all the way over, you can see that all the way here, not quite to Kapoho, but quite a ways, almost to Pohoiki, we're having south flank adjustments all the way to there. That's interesting as well. It's not always been that way. It, it kind of starts and stops. It's not ominous for the Lower East Rift or anything. That thing is moving a lot. What we really concern ourselves about in the near future is the integrity of the system up near the summit up in here. That's why we already look at this, and only rarely does it make it all the way down like we saw in 2018. Still, we understand the concern, so we will keep covering and, and updating, and the message now is no, no cause for alarm. No forecast for cause and alarm in the Okay, so let's move on to look at the rates over time on the bottom here versus depth. And so we can look a little bit at the change in patterns of the earthquakes here. Zoom it in for you guys. So that's that big four pointer near the south flank in here. You can see that perhaps in this red and orange band at the top over here. There are still there's still a lot of earthquakes happening even during the eruption there, you know, um, not huge amounts, but um, actually I guess we're following this is the last month here. So following the end of the eruption here, we start off having earthquakes under the summit and upper east rift. And we get that four pointer right in there. And it seems like after that the intensity of perhaps increases. Maybe a little bit denser right through there. Let me zoom it back out so you can get a better view of it here. There, there's a dividing mark in here and maybe slightly less dense in here compared to over here. So it, see it's all connected somehow. That's part of the complexity of the system here. Um, also of note is that if you look at this blue band at the bottom, this is something that comes in in a corner out here. It comes in on this bottom left corner as the Pahala earthquakes over here, right? This is what a lot of them are. You do get a few here, here's some of the purple ones, blue ones, all through, blue ones kind of all through there, mostly in here. Um, still some over here, right? So combined both of them together, you can see that they are also flaring a little bit more. Of course, these things flare and, and go through pulses regardless of what's happening on the surface. So it's just interesting to see that they're, you're having an increase down here and up here at the same time. And the co combination may be why we see those peaks on the earthquake counts here. There's that little purple cluster. That's interesting. They don't get those all the time. So just uh, note that in our heads and see if someday that has any, any uh, link that we can make to, to what's happening on, on this here. But interesting to note that earthquake down at 45, 50 kilometers down. That's almost 30 miles underground. Yeah. Fascinating there. So that is the earthquakes. Um, look the last week so we can zoom it in a little more and and maybe what's happening more of right now rather than the integration of the whole last month and so you can see in some of these blue ones interesting deep earthquakes happening under the summit greater summit area right around here right that's something like i just said we'll note but um we can't connect to the surface in any predictable way you see a lot of that last month activity is within the last week here you can see that same pattern clearly visible, right? And this is what I wanted to point out here. You start to see a few around Maka Pui Crater, around Napao Crater over here. Um, Kamoamoa eruption that was in 2014, um, uh, right in here. What was right in here. Right? So not quite all the way to there, but you're starting to see some activity in through here. So you maybe you might imagine or you maybe have a pathway that's starting to trying to make make its way around this curve here, meaning that complexity of forces, of course. And just to complete it here, let's look at the time depth for the last week here. And not as not really as readily apparent. Maybe maybe slightly more over here in a sign, but it's not really super obvious. And you can see a little bit more of this. Um, Episodicity, the darker, the deeper the blue earthquake dots here. 
move on through before we uh, finish off our 2020-2021 erup uh, eruption summary here. We'll look at the deformation data on the surface from USGS. And you can see that at present, we are entering a deflation cycle once again. And this is the last two-day plot right up here. Looking at the past week, you see that we had one deflation inflation event. And now we're starting another one over here, but with a net upwards. It's easier to see that in the past month as it has been recently here. So here's the past month, and here's our we're at the very right end, our deflation inflation that we're coming into. But you see there was another one and a smaller one, a smaller one, a bigger one, a bigger one. And so that's part of the background here and something that we're um, curious still about and, you know, always keeping our, an open mind about what that might connect to. But it's really uh, no hard connection to what's happening in this here. So we're looking at the background average beyond that. And you can see there's this general upward trend here. Um, so the tilt is climbing. The U.S. just describes this as mild inflation. Um, so while a tilt is climbing, and I did mention last week that sometimes a tilt doesn't climb very much uh, before you have some of these summit events. Um, when, you're, when it does show a signal on a tilt, it often shows a signal on a range of 10, 15 microradians within an order of hours. So that would be rapid inflation a tilt. That's not what we're seeing anywhere. Um, I will Maybe next week I can pull up an older plot from one of the old eruptions that shows that. Uh, didn't have time today, but um, just to point out, I do, I do know that there are some viewers out there. You know, uh, shout out Kenny, and you guys, you keep commenting. Yeah, look out for the tilt. So uh, we are we are watching the tilt. It is certainly rising, but it's ri rising at that mild rate and nothing alarming yet. So the tilt is not a dead giveaway in this case. I am a little more concerned when I look at the summit. Concern as far as from. Um, thinking there might be a more imminent chance of eruption. Because if we look at the summit GPS here, summit distance, here's our build up to the eruption over much of 2020. Through here, you can see that it was spreading from north to south. And after the initial first phase of the eruption, it was also still spreading north to south, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. But more recently here, it's picked up faster again, right? And you see that before the 2020 eruption here, that's when it was getting pretty steep showing a faster rate, that's when you know it's, it's approaching that failure state, when it starts inflecting the curve upwards like that, right? So if I zoom in here, and it's I said this caveat before, you gotta be really careful with these most recent data plots on the G GPS on the right side, because sometimes it get averaged, corrected, there's error, or whatever else. Um, one point could hold undue influence, right? If you think that's, that's the trend, you might say this thing is shooting straight up, right? But if you think, okay, well, really, it's, it should be an average of the range of it, then maybe we're looking at something that's that's still steep, but it's something like that. In any case, that's steeper than this, steeper than this, steeper than this even. Maybe the same steepness as what's happening down in here. Right? That's that is the more uh, imposing signal here that we're starting to accelerate the spreading rate. And if that's the case, then maybe we don't need a tilt to pop it off. So I'm looking at especially the combination of this. And the pattern as as this evolves over the next few weeks, and the earthquakes combined, um, that's what gave it away the last time, December 2020, November 2020. And we're going to be comparing um, in the coming weeks how our current status compares to that 2020 November prior to the opening of the of the fissure in December 2020. First intrusion December 2nd, then eruption December 20th. One small caveat on that, when we talk about the GPS, we normally uh, mention how we always hesitate just slightly when we're using those very new, the most recent GPS points. And these, these signals are much better once you get a little bit more time on them. So, you know, time yeah. is going to tell for this really, you know, what what is happening or how steep is this increased? Um, yeah. But yeah, with well, just a little bit of hedging, we always do on those signals, right? The most recent few uh, bumps on there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, thanks for restating that, Dane. And you know, just to, for example, here, you know, last week when we screenshotted this, our, our edge of our plot was right here, and we saw this thing looked like it might be rising. Like, oh, if you look at it, it looks like it's coming straight up. And then you see the next set of set of weeks is essentially mirroring it. It's just showing the noise in the data right there. And so, 
that could be the same thing that happens. But even if it does that again here, it's still showing upward trend, and the ex it's more about the exact rate that we're worried about and how steep it gets, and it should build to that. It's not always so clean. If we look back over here to, to uh, 2020, late 2020 era, you see that there's, there are times when the data holds closer together and there are times when it doesn't. So you re we'll really have to just wait and see. So we're not quite to that steepness um, where we're jumping and you're seeing big gaps Right, huge gaps in there. Um, mostly everything is is clustering still here, so that's what we'll look for. Um, there isn't once I, once again, there's nothing imminently um, alarming here. It's just that's that's building towards an eruption sooner than later when you start to see that kind of signal. And still, you know, if you were to were to push me on it, I'm still saying in you know, order weeks to months, right? rather than, for example, hours to days kind of thing. All right, so we come down to the, G to the GPS at Pu'o'o, and similar as well, we've, we're talking about this caveat, right? You know, we've just talked about this being a little bit of bait earlier when that popped up and it looked like, like things were just shooting straight up. But you can see here this natural span of noisiness of the data, and it could be that there's real embedded signals within here that we can't quite decipher because of some of that. but. For our purposes, when we see this kind of spread, then we have to pull back a little bit on the, the interpretation. But overall, average uh, doesn't seem to be um, spreading, right? So maybe instead of sagging and deflating, right, like it was as magma was flowing back towards the summit during the eruption, um, now that that stopped, maybe we're at some more equilibrium through here and if magma does come back around, we'll expect to see this to turn back up. So that's what we're looking for, is whether that turns back up and when that actually happens as a signal of magma coming back into the pool era area there. And to explore this a little more, we'll go into the GPS here. This is the two-year GPS. Um, these are the summit stations. I won't go into huge, huge detail of all of these, but you know, um, this is northwest, this is east, southwest, and southeast, and components east component, north component, up component, every one of them. So I would just point out that in all of them, uh, that we are, we're going up before the eruption. We've been going up since the eruption, since eruption has been ongoing. So up, moving up, moving up, moving up. Everything in the summit's moving up still. The ones that are in the northwest are moving North and west, the ones that are in the east, or this one's moving northeast, the one in the southeast is moving southeast, the one in the southwest is moving southwest, getting pushed in every part out from the middle in all directions and upwards. That's that's the detail of, of what this data actually shows. And I wanted to point out a little bit more of what you see on a rift zone here. So this is Mount Ulu here on the left. And we'll look at the up first once again. And you can see that this is the eruption. These are, these are two-year plots. So this is a so this is the uh, 2020 eruption in December, right in here. And that drop was that first couple weeks of eruption. And since then, you can see that we've been moving to the east, still so moving to the south. And you can see that uh, not really up or down convincingly within the spread of the data either. Right? Possibly it is, but it's hard to really tell what's happening there. But interesting that there's a little bit of a change here um, noticeable in the east just in the last month or so since the lava stopped intruding into the volcano um, near surface. So looking at kind of new Yohamo, uh, you can see similar on the east. You can see on the north that we're also wiggling back, right, moving back to the north as if we're still adjusting to magma coming in, not coming in, the flux is changing over time there. And on the up, it's hard to really see, but um, I have to click through on this one too. And it's, there's once again, a big span of range of data, right, but you know, may, maybe there is a slight increase, we'll have to wait and see there as well, but um, definitely not dropping like it was earlier during the eruption there and possibly it's it's staying flat and you see a lot of little wiggles in here so it's really hard to tease out what exactly is going on in there but that's the kind of thing where if you had more um, precise data you could look and look and see which stations are moving exactly where so uh, coming to Kamomoa 11 miles east of the summit here 
Um, you don't see that adjustment quite there yet. You don't see that pool. So hard to say exactly, right? You know, may maybe it's transitioning here. Um, you don't really see any change, especially in the up at pool. Um, maybe a slight bumps in other places, but this also seems consistent with the magma being somewhere in an area between maybe maybe as near as Kamoamoa, but more likely slightly further up rift still, and it's starting to affect these stations if it's trying to work its way around or push its way around or move the, the earth so that it can fit through there. Um, move the existing faults, just shift the blocks that are around so that the pressure can, can work its way around and inject into those cracks and fill them, widen them, and pressurize them. That so the point being that we see a difference here, um, subtle difference from pool oil, um, from up, upper rift of pool oil to pool oil itself. And if we look uh, further down at Jonica, we don't see any signal at all. And that's our reassurance there that that barrier between pool oil and further, further down still appears to be intact. We don't see any of that variation even through the eruption in the last um, few months here. Not, not a lot of change at all. Pretty steady, consistent all the way across there. So that is reassuring. Um, we'll leave the GPS at, at that for that for for today. And we will just mention that there is a Volcano Watch out today that is about the campaign GPS season here. And there are two ways to um, measure GPS, of course. Um, Generally speaking, is how they divided divided it and portrayed it here, right? Um, one is our continuous permanent stations that are just put in that we're checking every day in our updates. Uh, the other one is these campaign style, where you might go areas that are harder to get, but not deploy your instrument for as long. You might leave it out there for a few days, or in some cases for a few minutes or a few hours, um, rather than having it be cemented into the ground and all the time. We need to have its own battery and power supply and transmitter to transmit the data in real time and all the web setup and all of that. So these guys are they're basically going to set up the station, come back and collect it after a few days. Um, the data is stored locally on that machine. You need to, then you then download it directly into your workstation and you can go from there, right? It's not an online kind of thing. It allows you to, to, to survey areas that have been done by this more traditional method for longer for um, compare, compare to long-term signals over time. So. The point of all this being, there's more GPS data from Mauna Loa coming in at some point. And we'll have to wait to see when it's shared and how it's shared. But this is a yearly survey, and perhaps we'll see some results um, that are extra in addition to these continuous data that we're looking at from these uh, campaigns that happen every summer here, of course. Um, why in the summer? Well, sometimes these there have been times in the past where we could not survey areas of Mauna Loa because they're under snow rise it's Mauna Kea perhaps uh, more so but same problem as so uh, the article will be on hawaiitracker.com if it's not already um, it will be on shortly and you guys can look at the, the details as well including this kinematic, kinematic GPS KGPS right where they're actually using just a few minutes of deployment for less accuracy less precision one or two inches precision rather than the the the, the more longer term stations there. So if you're in a hurry, you can you can do something like this. Um, that is interesting to read about here as well. So that's the Volcano Watch for GPS. We'll move on to finish our data here. I just want to make sure that we um, come back to our source in case it's not been clear. All the information we're using here is uh, from the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, it's the source of all of this. We're adding some context and interpretation and um, trying to show all the different things put out and make them into a coherent story here. But the source is the USGS for a lot of this information. And the update put out on Tuesday, June 8th, a couple of days ago, um, is no eruption. It could resume or it could be quiescence prior to the next eruption. We'll discuss that distinction here shortly. That was last week's Volcano Watch. But we'll cover this first. And observations most recently, June 4th, 54 tons per day of SO2. So that's still in that range of less than 100 and in that, in that range, the range that's essentially background. Um, and they note one deflation inflation cycle. They know, you know, um, not a whole lot of change there. Um, while we're talking about the GPS, I will note that they have not changed their East Rift Zone observations. And they are still saying that 
The summit upper east rift zone between a summit and Pu'o'o is refilling at rates similar to those measured over the past two years and before the December 2020 eruption. So that is the official take on, on it, and we're looking at some of the um, finer detail that maybe is uh, uh, not referenced in here or not referenced yet, right? So this is certainly adequate. A little bit, a little bit more um, teasing, I suppose, from the signals we're going to share with you guys here. So we'll wait and see what happens with the East Rift there, um, the Upper East Rift especially. That seems to be the most connected. Meanwhile, at the summit, the Lava Lake, no surface activity or evidence of activity in over the past week, except for minor subsidence in the order of 1 to 2 meters, 3 to 7 feet. That's the main event, main change at the summit here. Small temperature spots around the rim and local cavities remain in thermal webcam views, but at temperatures well below those associated with molten lava. So that is a uh, major change is, you know, three to seven feet. Um, we did have a comment that I, uh, um, I saw that someone was asking, asking about where, how big an area. This is very, very localized. Just small little areas um, are collapsing, not the entire over 100 acres collapsing down three to seven feet. It's just small pockets, especially where that active lava lake area was in the west. That eastern part already did its settling and collapsing all of that already way earlier in eruption. So it's really that western area near the vent that's doing most of that little adjustment. And um, so it's, it's small scale stuff there. And the reason that's happening, of course, is you imagine if the lava is still liquid underground and it's got gas and the gases can still bubble their way and move, move their way out. And once the lava hardens to form some kind of matrix, that's when it's hard enough to crack, when you start forming cracks and then the big chunks of rock can settle independently and then you can start having shifts and subsidence and collapses. And so the combination of the contraction of the lava due to cooling, but also to the gas escape, um, which uh, the gas escape changing, of course, once once everything is solidified, you can't just move the gas bubbling it through the lava. You have to diffuse it out of there afterwards, right? And find a way out into the crack. And so that's a different longer term process. So consistent with this, this one or two meters, three to seven feet um, is what we see on a lava lake lake depth measurement. So let's cover our lava lake signals here. And first, SO2. Make it bigger here. Uh, there's our most recent, just above 50. And similar to the ones we've had here, all in that range, less than 100. Our last one that was over 100 was, um, looks like maybe the 27th. It's been almost two weeks. And if that one is just perhaps the the, the Aberration, you can go further back a little bit more, another further week back there. Back to the 23rd or so. So it's been been very low SO2, and I'm sure that everyone who has been dealing with VOG, um, less so in, in recent months than early on in December and January, but still dealing with it, um, especially on the Kona side and Ka'u side, are very happy to see these members stay down. Here's our depth plot, and the depth is, this is the last month here. So this is the drop that was most recently evident on the 5th, where we went from 229 meters to 226 meters. And that may be similar to that little subsidence contraction events that the USGS is describing. This one was 3 meters, it's consistent with an order of 1 or 2 meters there. So that may, may be, it looks like one very quick event dropped it down and you still see these variations that may be related to degassing or some not clear what other influences is happening there. But while it's still visible, this will be the last update we can see this because of this month plot. About a month ago, it's really hidden here behind this label, translucent through here. There's a step right here. This was the last time the lava lake actually rose, was back on May 13th. So by, by next week, this will be have scrolled off left, left of our graph here. We won't see it anymore. Just, just a documentation here of the last intrusion of lava near a surface under that crust of the lava lake. Lifted the crust up, didn't actually poke out the lava at that point from this exact spot based on a pattern. All the lava was circulating and popping up um, as late as the 23rd of May, right in here or so. That's the pattern here in a lava lake, and 
try to tease out what actually happened. It's not so easy. But here is an image from the F1 camera on June 4th. We'll compare it to one that was June 5th. Okay. And I have it zoomed in and off center here on purpose because I have to click it back and forth and it's really subtle for me to for me to point out where it is. It's actually so it's right in here is the area where you can see a little bit of subtle change in the dark blue and purple there. And I wonder if I can make it bigger. Let's try to put it in one more time. Now I'm a little bit so let me it's quite lined up, but it'll be right in here. Right in there. Very subtle change. It could be that that's where the laser is pointing. For that one measurement spot, and it could be that that's the size, for example, of that little subsidence event might be just that big right in there. So this is just one little event that happened to be caught in a laser that we actually could look for here. It's hard to catch these otherwise in the thermal imagery, and it's super, super subtle. If you look at the thermal imagery last 24 hours now from the USGS automatic, things look, in fact, pretty stable. What if I could stop moving the image? There it is. Load itself. There is the image. See no obvious changes. You really see these these hot spots around the west vent still down in here, and around that last remnant era area of that west pond, right in there. Interesting. You do see some from this angle, looking looking down. You do see it in that. Um, ooze up area between the hardened crust and the crater wall, right? And so I uh, see a little bit over here as well. And we know that there's gas coming out over here. Depending on the camera angle, you might see more of this thermal ooze up area staying hot around the entire, entire perimeter here. Hard to tell, but that, that wouldn't be surprising given the angles we see here. Okay, so here is a visible view. Not a whole lot of change there. Dark at night, a little flash of moon there. And make sure we show you the visible analog of that thermal imagery. And about this much probably correspond to what you're seeing in that thermal, thermal image right there. So those hot spots are right down in here and at the west vent right in here. And we'll look at a few of the photographs here before we take our our, our break and finish up 2021 and we'll once again turn to 2018 after our break so any questions on 2020 2021 um get them in here and we'll finish off with a couple of these last photographs put up by the usgs this one's put out a couple days ago um june 8th summit and so they're showing here that there's an area of lava flow that's still putting out gas see it gassing through the, the crust here on its perimeter very near this big yellow sulfur Sulfur bank on a wall of Holly Mountain Mountain Crater right in there. Look through for a higher resolution version here. Zoom it in some more. See that line of fume emitting through the lava there, and it kind of shows you that there is a little bit of a difference between this ooze up lava flow area and a very perimeter and this hardened crust that's more in an interior. And perhaps some weakness there that this gas can come up and through. That's interesting to see in and of itself. Um, but that's not the only part of the story, of course. Um, I wanted to point out that back on April 2nd, we have this photograph from the USGS. When this area was getting buried. And here is a red lava and that ooze up flow coming up right there along that edge. And here's that big sulfur bank right through there. So the lava actually that was oozing up from this crack came in it buried, buried in a lava level might be a little bit higher now. 
not much, a few meters, but essentially these steam vents, this big yellow boulder right in there, that's buried underneath a lava crust now. So not surprising to see that thing keep venting as far as, as the location, right? But it does, does uh, it's not ominous. It doesn't mean anything new is happening there. That area has been venting for a long time it's before lava was coming up when there was still water ponding. It's just now we're seeing it rather than coming up through the crater, rather than coming up through the water, it's now coming up through the hardened lava crust area right through there, as well as in a crater wall still. Add that back together for you guys here. There's another couple photographs here. So here is a um, different angle of that. Let me click all the way through on it as well. So there is that sulfur bank area back here in the background. This is the eastern edge of the lava lake. And also on here um, is the old Crater Rim Drive Road, which is right there. Several chunks, several big chunks. Different levels of sliding into the into the pit there. And of course, each of these chunks is cracked along itself internally as well. Zoom it in for the guys there. Let's see what this old road looks like. Let's see little little slivers of it stuck all by itself there. Piece of the center line down over here. All the way over here. Road to nowhere. That's not nowhere, it is somewhere. I want to drive into. That is that. You released by the USGS as well. Back here. That. Uh, June 9th. There is one more release of images here on June 10th, earlier today, and it's discussing the June 8th overflight and field work. And so here is UFAS assist in flight gear hiking across the. Here is like perhaps that down drop block there in a caldera. And another view of that crested lava lake. All hardened, viewed, viewed from uh, viewed from the north here, right? or west west and areas down here at the bottom right. That active pond area was most recently active. There is the island. There's that hardened eastern surface, and the sulfur is on the north bank. An area that we've discussed in the past. Repeated field surveys, putting out different kinds of instrumentation, seismic, sonic, um, gravity, all kinds of things. Um, so interesting to see that they're uh, what they will say about what they found out there. And another view of the southwest crater wall from the down drop block there, that upper cliff, right? So perhaps this is close to that 800 meter elevation. This might be the 900 meter elevation that the lava would have to top into. To or into that main caldera area. So still a lot of area to go. And if you missed our update last week, all of 2020, 2021 eruption only filled 5% of the collapse area, area uh, volume of 2008. So we'll finish it off here. I wanted to bring up something that Dane found on Twitter here from user Cosme, also on Hawaii Tracker. And this is a Sentinel view time lapse of the entire eruption of Kilauea here. Straight above, it's a mix of natural images and false color. You can see the progression of the lake of water through the full crater lava lake, and then as it contracts towards the west, towards the vent area over the five months here. Hello, go check out hawaiitracker.com. You guys can see that. Find the original link and the Sentinel data there as well. So we'll finish off this 2021 section with just a touch back quickly on the volcano watch from last week, the difference between an eruption and a pause. And long story short, it's whether it's longer than 90 days. That's all that they, that's the current consensus. They, they uh, justify it, of course. It's all good, of course. Um, but essentially, we're going to use different words. If it, if it erupts again within 90 days, we'll, we'll end up calling it a pause and a new episode. If it takes 91 days, we'll call it an eruption. 
so pretty arbitrary in that way. Overall, the long term pattern of the volcano is that there's magma coming into it at higher rates since 1950, and perhaps more so since the early 2000s. And overall, it's just a matter of time before it pops out again somewhere else, right? So whether we call it all one longer era of activity, of continuous activity, ultimately, or we say it's a pause or a new eruption, it doesn't really matter in the long term. It's more just how we put our human um, constructs here on this natural process. So that's the only difference is 90 days. And so the question is, will it last more or less than 90 days before it pops out again? And the jury is still out, of course, because as I've showed you guys, the earthquakes are building. The tilt is coming up, not super fast, but it is coming up. The GPS is spreading. We determined how quickly, but certainly quicker than before. And we'll have to wait and see. Wait and see what happens next. That is that is the summary of what's happening in 2021 here. Our current monitoring signals on a volcano. I do want to mention, as I said before, that this is a lot of this information is on hawaiitracker.com, um, where we have updated our photos displays here so you can come and see some of the great photographs posted by some of our local photographers including Ray Durgan here so check that out and if you are a photographer you can go on there as well and you actually can link to sell your prints from there and of course it has to be uh, appropriate and local and relevant and approved and I'll turn it over to Dane to proceed with some more other thank yous yeah, so we do want to thank our sponsors first and foremost. We do have two uh, local businesses that are helping us out. First one is Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa. They do a twist on some traditional dishes that you may be familiar with. Um, fine dining without the price in a lot of ways. It's, it's I enjoy it. Um, fish and chips there is great. Steaks are good. Um, the burgers are you know amazing. It's, you know, great spot to go uh, chill out inside, outside, indoor, outdoor dining options. They got a bar. So, and also you can do takeout for those, uh, you know, COVID safe uh, people that still like do the takeout option. They got it for you. Uh, really appreciate their support. Our second sponsor is Kalani Tours in Kona. They do a variety of different tour options, uh, including volcano tours, not any lava to see right now, but guarantee next time it uh starts back up you know they'll be running those tours again and they're still running them and there's still plenty to learn right you can there's all kinds of history to be educated about and that's what they try and do is a little more little smaller groups than some of the big tour companies so you get a little bit more personalized experience with uh, somebody with a lot of local knowledge so we really appreciate them uh, being a sponsor as well, and they do the volcano tours, uh, waterfall tours, and uh, coffee farm tour. Really good stuff. Appreciate them. We do want to encourage uh, anybody that appreciates this type of content to like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and all that jazz. It helps us out a lot. It really does. It's surprising how much it actually does. We don't have the advertising revenue of you know many big media organizations, so we rely on viewers like you to share the word and you know if you like this then show it to a friend that really does help uh we do take monetary donations on hawaiitracker.com hawaiitracker.com slash support and with that let's get into some questions oh we want to thank our uh our grant uh white community foundation as well uh we do have a, a grant to help us uh with some operational costs to produce these type streams as well as manage the content that does on Hawaii Tracker. So we always appreciate um, everybody that helps us continue to do this type of content regularly. So with yeah. that, let's get into some questions. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah and, and so yeah, and, and just a little bit more, that, that is the Hawaii Island Strong Fund, right? The Puna Strong Program and it's a partnership with the County of Hawaii as well. So right. we thank the County of Hawaii as well. All right. So we got some interesting ones. Um, I'm going to start off with combining two because they're kind of similar. And actually, these might be better for the later part. Um, but let's talk about Sherry has a question about how we we're talking. Uh, you're talking about the tides and the influence of the, the moon and that. Um, but there is a little bit of a uh, question about the conceptualization of that. Like, how does the tilt change? Is this the whole? volcano 
moving or is this focused at the summit um like the, yeah. the magma chamber swelling or like a, a vertical dike type thing is the uh yeah it's culprit it's, it's i mean we we often associate the tides with the liquid ocean right moving it moving around but the tidal forces are present across everywhere all the solid earth as well as the liquid right so the liquid can mobilize more easily but the solid earth feels that force as well and when you have an instrument as sensitive as a tote meter it can it just it just feels it so it's not just one part of the volcano it's the whole island as a whole it's the whole the whole you know not quite the hemisphere right um as a whole um Feeling it, and of course, we're mostly water all around us. So mostly, it's water around us. But when, you know, when, for example, the continental U.S. is facing, facing or going through that that maximum spring king tide, for example, then that the the rocks there will feel it as well. Yeah, and so that's be interesting. interested. Uh, there's, yeah. there's there's always some there's always a force there, and there's always some trigger to to push things along. And so you know, um, it's just a matter of magnitude. Always, like you know, how how does that size to the magma pushing its way, right? Right. I would be interested to see uh, what this looks like on Hualalai, kind of the tilt meter that we use as a baseline for background activity. Um, but also Hualalai doesn't have the magma chamber, at least we don't suspect it that it does. So there might be some differences in how it operates there, but and there's know, also that's the, kind of the... Yeah, there, there's the installation as well, right? You know, how, mm. what are the details, details of the installation? Um, what's the top topographic relief? Are you like um, on, a, you know, some kind of feature above the ground that might have might be more exposed to tides or you're buried inside of a hole and all that stuff matters also and a lot of that local stuff can make a big difference and that makes right. it really hard to compare for example one instrument on Mauna Loa to the one on Hualai you know the one on Hualai right. might, might have some other factor that's more important and shows stronger and right. it's just you know so it's when, you, when you can see it and pick it out and be like oh that might be what that is because it looks very similar you know it's still not 100 percent conclusive but that, that you know it's not always that clear and so I, because it did look like oh look this week it looks pretty pretty close but i would share that with you guys right. yeah um one thing i do want to mention is how small a micro radiant is because it's hard to conceptualize the best explanation that i've heard is if you were to take a one kilometer long board so a solid board, one kilometer long, exactly straight, and you were to place a dime under one end of it, that that angle change that you would see would be roughly one micro radiant. So in a lot of these changes, we're talking about even a half a micro radiant. So go ahead and double the size of the board type of thing. It, it, it's a very small measurement, but we can still detect it. So we talk about it. Yeah. So yeah, closer to a mile long board for that half, half a micro radiant. Imagine a steel bar that doesn't sag perfectly level. Right. So CHS has a question about earthquake activity, not Hawaii earthquake activity, but uh, Alaska, that the advisory level had been raised. Um, I'm not exactly sure where, but like I was thinking in general, what is the the conceptualization of the threat from Alaska, the persistent threat of earthquakes sending something our way from Alaska. Uh, earthquake sending something our way. Or, um, or an earthquake triggering a tsunami. Yeah, that's all. That's kind of an all the time hazard that exists for us. Um, the, uh, the, as far as I'm aware, the alert advisories that are on Alaska that have been raised are the volcanic alert advisories, right? So, uh, there, because volcanoes, do, you know, Alaska has a lot of volcanoes. Um, whole Aleutian Arc, all the way to Kamchatka, is, is all volcanoes. So, um, a lot of area is not very, very uh, inhabited or at all, or sometimes just marginally so. Um, so it's it's not a huge impact the eruptions themselves, right? So um, it's more so because aircraft use that corridor a lot. That the ash that comes up from those volcanoes affects right. the whole northern Trans-Pacific corridor. That that the, that's such an important thing. So, a lot of times the the um, and in fact a lot of the volcano alert and aviation codes come from that use case of of what information is being used for. You know, U.S. Yes, information is being used for for aviation. So um, there have been some several volcanoes. I'm not, I don't um, I try to find it here, but uh, uh, 
there have been alert levels put up in Alaska, which volcano it was now. Um, let me see here. Uh, semi so Pochnoi maybe. I don't know. Um, that one is at at a aviation code orange and alert level watch, for example. So probably the highest one on there. Um, and and that's not unusual. Maybe every month there's one that goes goes on alert or puts out a little ash puff or has increased earthquakes or something like that. So um, it's interesting to note. Um, it's a whole different cycle there because they have, they have so many volcanoes that they're dealing with as opposed to us here. You know, for them, they have so many that one may go off just from the sheer number they have. Even if the eruptions are just little small ash outbursts per se, right? Right. All right. Um, Andre asks about is the about Kilauea. Uh, is the volcano effectively capped for magma purposes, or is it like a scab that can crack and bleed again? Gas kill, uh, still escapes, but if magma wanted to rise, would it seal the crack? Yeah, I, I think it's it's more like the scab, really. Right, the scab, and you know, I mean. This, Depending how long it takes, the scab can grow thicker, and at some point, a scab could be enough to to become a cap per se, right? But that scab, you know, the edges of it are still weak, and so you could still have have pathways of magma up through the summit. And in fact, you know, the whole the whole fill of the caldera is is loose rubble that's a result result of various summit collapses over the history of the caldera that have been filled with layers of lava that have come and kind of glaze over them. So it's just a bunch of rubble under there buried with this kind of flat looking stuff. It looks like one big solid block, but there's, it's all cracked and jumbled all underneath that glaze that you see on the surface of it as well. So right. the whole thing is like, it's like, you know, a giant mass of scar tissue. You go with the right. analogy a little further and it can come up anywhere through there. And it's a matter of which particular spot compared, you know, through all the different, chunks of hardened lava can find up. It's a good analogy really. Um could think of plenty worse ones or have seen plenty worse ones. So that's you know that was a good one. Um mm -hmm. thank you Andre. So Charles asked about the some deep rock fracturing, right? If how conceptually does uh earthquakes at say 40 kilometers work within the 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 half solidified half molten rock there or is it more rock than molten how does that conceptually work yeah I mean, to have to have the fracture it has to be solid and it has to be uh, at a low enough temperature that it actually behaves in a brittle fashion rather than flowing um one analogy that maybe we could use is plato if you have plato and it's it's cold and you you pull it, give it a good yank, it'll just snap right apart. If that same Play-Doh is warm or hot and you give it a yank, it'll just ooze out and string out apart, right? Because it's, it, if it's oozing and flowing out, it's hot enough to flow like as a fluid by ductile de uh, deformation as opposed to brittly snapping and breaking. So rock has to be solid and it has to be cold enough, which is why you, you really don't see a whole lot deeper than that, right? That's near the limit. And so somewhere near the limit in that interface, there's probably areas of that depth that you can't have earthquakes because the rock is too hot or too liquid and other areas where it, it isn't. And clearly where the earthquakes are happening, it isn't. And so it's, and it's likely some interaction between the more mobile stuff that can move around and a solid rock that can't. And that's why it's getting, getting pressured and then breaking in some way, right? Right. So, um, yeah, um, as far as like the you know, com compressibility, yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the rock is compressible to a certain point and then it starts, then it's starts push, um, transmitting that pressure across to further distances to along the fault line, the whole fault can move as a, as one, right? So that's part of the process is the compressibility of it. Yeah. And, and magma is also compressible, which is a, a big wrench and a lot, of, a lot of simplifications that we make, but, um, right. There is also a company. I'll leave it at that. All right. We got, we'll do one more question for this round. Um, two, pine, two pineapples asks, uh, why do weather patterns change when eruptions are happening? Um, saw He saw an uptick in rain over the course of the most recent eruption in Hawaiian Acres. 
Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that it's that it's something very easy to answer. I'll put it that way, right? Because first of all, especially on our island, the, the rainfall patterns are so localized that right. um, to track a chain, you know, like a change in eruption could easily make one place wetter and another place drier at the same time. And that's really hard to track exactly the effects of that without getting the, the weather modeling guys involved, right? And I haven't, haven't seen um, publication on that, and I can go hurt or not, but I haven't seen anything like that. We do know that essentially right. there, there's a lot of a lot of gas and heat coming out, and that does interact with the atmosphere, and it can drive drive the circulation patterns, right? And of course, heat in the atmosphere is what drives all of the weather, you know, um, formation of clouds and precipitation and water from them and all that stuff. So, I, right, certainly it does affect it, right? You know, so um, but I can't answer exactly how or in detail why necessarily either, apart from we know it does it's, yeah it's, you know those are the variables involved it's messing with those variables and there is an effect for sure and as far as how exactly and making sense of it i, I really can't um very easily with the 2018 eruption um do that i'm sorry 2021 right. eruption do that yeah 2018 was different because the volume was so high that it so was so much heat out there super yeah. obvious yeah we just had a giant rainstorm dumping not just inches of rain a day, but upwards of multi, uh, a foot of rain a day, every day during 2018. It was, it, my yard never floods because it's mostly just rock and cinder. And somehow it turned into a swamp during that time. Like yeah. it was an few incredible months. amounts of rain. Yeah. Just few, months few and months, months of rain. And that summer of 2018. Yeah. Yeah. And even after it stopped the eruption, there was still so much heat out there that That's it true. just continued that pattern for a couple months, even after the eruption ended, it just our right. patterns here were crazy. Yeah, and then of course you add the whole lane into it as well, and that. Right. Place. Yeah, so um, there is a couple other questions, but I'm going to hold those because it'd be better for after the 2018 little presentation that we have to wrap this up. All right. Well, hopefully, won't go too long on this because I know we've been going for a while already. But this is for you guys who are more interested in what on some of these details, and you know, are still tuned into us here, um, over an hour into our um, presentation today. So I just wanted to recap some of the 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 research that's come out and today I'm going to focus just on one issue of one journal bulletin of Okanology here and it's this topical collection referring to the historic events of Kiloe in 2018 summit collapse rifts on eruption and magnitude 6.8 earthquake and we've reviewed some of this stuff before some of these other um, topics in the past but I'm going to, going to put out uh, uh, the conclusions of a few of these ones here um, so first we'll look at this gas paper, degassing of 2018, and um, a lot of these are behind paywalls, so we're not going to go through. We're not going to go through um, anything beyond the abstract and the conclusions here, but I'll let you I'll highlight for you guys here. So essentially, they propose that decades to centuries of repeated lava-like activity and drain back during eruptions like Kilauea recycled substantial vol volumes of degas magma into the shallow system. And that degassed magma likely reduced the volatile contents of the lower East Rift Zone eruption, Fisher 8 magmas, resulting in lower fountain heights compared to many prior Kilauea eruptions. The eruption's extreme SO2 emissions were due to high lava effusion rates rather than really volatile rich melts. And also when, when you're seeing this word volatile, that's the, 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 the gases and um, water vapor and that kind of stuff, right? So um, that's, that's basically what it's saying. Is that it wasn't that the magma was extra hot and gassy necessarily, because a lot of it is showing a signal that it had actually been degassed either through a lava lake or some previous, previous, previous eruption already. It was more so that there was so much of it. And that's what uh, led to the highest SO2 uh, emissions there so that's that's all i'll say about this first paper here by the by alan lerner um usgs hvo uh, associates as well um and city of hawaii and next we'll just mention this one the lava effusion rate evolution of the rate and the erupted volume during the eruption 
by Hannah Dietrich and colleagues here, USGS um, lead author here. And essentially they are trying to um, quantify the output rate of lava there, right? And so we're going to talk about this DRE, this dense rock equivalent. We've brought it up in the past. That's something that if you take out the gas content of the lava, um, how much came out? Because the gas can come out with more lava, more gas. The lava can come out with more gas or less gas, and that can change the volume substantially if you're just measure, measuring it combined. So to compare one to the other, you like to compute the dense rock equivalent here. All right, so... And that comes out, they say, from early May, it increased from 7 cubic meters per second to about 100 cubic meters per second early, from early to late May. And by mid-June to over 200 cubic meters per second when it had focused at Ahu Ailao. And by the end of the eruption, somewhere between 0 0.9 to 1.4 cubic kilometers DRE of lava had erupted, right? Dense rock equivalent. So if we were to add the gas, that's what those earlier preliminary volumes are for, is with the gas, when we're saying up to like one and a half kilometers, now they're going even higher, 1.4 kilometers DRE without the gas. That's a big amount, is a range, of course. With 0.4 cubic kilometers on land and at least 0.5 cubic kilometers offshore. So they are saying that some, somewhere around 60% of the lava was emplaced offshore underwater in 2018. And so if that's really mind-blowing. And we knew, that, we knew at the time the lava was really pouring into the ocean there and it was going at massive rates and no one really knew how much. Um, and we saw how much it was on land. And everything on land uh, that we saw, I imagine that same volume again is, is doubled underwater. That's really interesting there. Um, this is the, the on land section here. I was just going to add that one of the crazy things about that uh, part, the lava delta, that we found out right after 2018, while the eruption was still ongoing, right? When the Nautilus EV uh, aquatic submarine team the, did the bathymetry out there, that survey, and we found, and they're basically like, yeah, the, the delta is at the angle of repose, the steepest angle that loose sediment can sit at. Yeah, without you know continuing to fall, and it was very different from you know what we were seeing at Puo for over the years. The benches that would build. Yeah, and that's a great great lead in because that's exactly what we're talking about next here. Is this next last paper we'll focus on today is exactly that. It's the submarine deltas oh, up here. Submarine lava deltas of the 2018 eruption of Kilauea volcano. And this is by Dr. Adam Soul out of University of Rhode Island, as well as Mike Zoller and Carolyn Parchetta at USGS HBO here. And so this is one we'll spend more time on. And as Dane mentions, this is the Nautilus, the Exploration Vehicle Nautilus. Here it is, run by the Ocean Exploration Trust, a famous nonprofit um, associated with Bob Ballard, right? Uh, the, the explorer who discovered the Titanic within his still does all kinds of other uh, work today. Anyways, the Ocean Exploration Trust running the EV Nautilus, here it is, that cruised by in um, really between August and September 2018, right after the eruption was over. And they, they were able to do this because they were already booked to map uh, Loihi. They had already had a, a, a research objective to go to Loihi. So we'll talk about these guys a little bit here. Here's their their research team here, a lot of this URI uh, crew on the back of the Nautilus here. You can see the, the submersible. We'll talk about it here shortly as well. Um, here they are, um, southwest of the Big Island near Loihi. And they have a command center back in Rhode Island, right, that they have uh, students and scientists there live at the same time as this cruise is ongoing. Uh, monitoring and helping them, and um, also they did a lot of live streaming. Still do a lot. Still do a lot of that. I'm not sure they were live streaming in 2018. They do do that nowadays. In fact, so that's well, they the, were. were they? they were live streaming that. Yep, I remember it. It was pretty. It was. It wasn't the highest quality of live stream, but it was live streaming. Yeah, awesome. So here's a little bit of what this found here at, at Luigi. Here's that 
some at Crater of Loihi and some of the, the Dragon Cave Pohaku site here with a where fluid comes out and it comes out at 18 degrees Celsius, those hydrothermal vents. And anyways, it's a little bit of a, of a but they were coming back from Loihi and the cruise over here. So here is their entire cruise. This is the no one newsletter. There's Loihi down here. They actually ended up um, surveying a lot of this southern shore of Hawaii Island, all the way around the corner of Kapoho, all the way, and then a lot of this Puna Ridge offshore to the well, so Big area surveyed, and really we're going to focus in on just right in here, especially for our like today. And so you can imagine there probably will be research coming out in the future for this and for that and for this area over here that everyone likes to talk about this whole Helena um, slump area and the Puna Ridge is something that's super interesting but not a whole lot of information out there as well so someday we'll see more about that I am sure um, as well as you know areas of, of um, hot water flow that they, that they try to sample and there's all kinds of other uh, nuances here as well right and to kind of tie into what Dane was was showing was was saying earlier a lot of material down there this is this is actually material this is photographs that they took with the submarine robot that they deployed. So here is at 295 meters depth, some finer grain blocks at the angle of repose, and here at 300 meters depth, bigger boulders at the angle of repose. But this was the one that's really um, striking to me. 692 meters depth, an intact lava flow down, you know, it was actually still flowing intact and not breaking apart down at almost 700 meters below sea level there. That's fascinating to see that, right? So let's get into the study a little bit more here. Um, here is the, that first figure and showing on land the, the 2018 eruption trace. Uh, this dashed line is an old coastline right through there. So you can see that we added coastline in a lot of these areas. And really there's four lobes to describe. They describe the Kapoho Lava Delta. They describe the Ahalanui Lava Delta. And this is the secondary one exists because back in July 10th, 2018, the lava that had been flowing around Kapoho, north of Kapu'u Kapoho, jumped its bank and flowed to the south of Halanui. So that gave us a secondary lava delta down here. And from earlier back eruption, from back in late May, when we had two flows come down to Mackenzie, we have down here two Mackenzie lobes, two Mackenzie lava deltas as well, here and here. Not quite as thick. The thickness is shown by the color, but does extend out not quite as far, but similar distance offshore, as you see at Ahalanui as well, right over there, right? And Kapoho is a little bit further, especially when you start considering the distance from the old shoreline all the way out to here. It ends up being a much, much larger distance. The Kapoho one is the, is the winner as far as volume and everything else. You can see it's pr pretty special its size. and distribution there. So here is zooming in to the Mackenzie ones you see there and there. There they are. And here is the Ahalanui and Kapoho ones. So Ahalanui right in here and Kapoho right up here. And, and in white ROV, the remote operating, remotely operated vehicle. This is the submarine that they deployed tracing this path right through here to this transect all through here. So that is something we'll look at here shortly as well. And another view of it, this is the ROV Hercules that was deployed off of the EV Nautilus. There it is right there. I saw it in an earlier photograph too. So what did it see? Well, let's come back here. I'll show you the photographs first here since we did jump there. So you see different views of, of slope, right? You see a coarser grained, material you see a mix of coarse grained and fine grained material you see areas another mix right in there intact lava where you can see the stretched out vesicles that court this looks like a cross section of an a, -a flow typical looks like something a -a you see on land um, one thing that's easy to see on this ex image in particular is this ashy coating that's on top of all this stuff right there describe this visible we're a long way offshore and if this is new land so this has to have come from ash that was formed at that lava ocean interface and so you are having some very fine material when we're looking at the photographs from the air 
um, from the boat, we could see the discoloration of the water with all that sediment. And that's that's this lighter stuff that's kind of raining down across large, large areas offshore and coating this very, very young new surface. Even these boulders, you can see that over here. Dusting on top of some of these boulders. See, they've been sitting there long enough and haven't really moved. Current's not really moving as well. Um, there's more intact flow. You can see there's, there's some life. There's some shrimp um, growing on here, right? And they're actually describing um, iron fixing bacteria um, visible at some of these areas. And an increased temperature is not very much less than one degree Celsius uh, above the ambient sea temperature in this area, but enough that they're seeing some sort of circulation. They're seeing microbial alterations. And here's, look, there's some sea life um, starting to colonize this area as well. So. I thought it was fascinating to see these images of what it looks like underwater in Kapoho. Right, this was, was about one month after the end of the eruption, more or less. And you can see a little bit of the, the, the mix of different kinds of things that are visible down there. So um, we'll talk about this, the size of things here as well. And even this, this slightly smaller stuff, this slightly smaller cobbles and stuff is different than pool. And pool, you saw a lot more of the sandy component. There's not a whole lot of sandy component here, and that's a big one of the big keys of why this thing may behave differently than Puo'o is that sand component, right? Um, without the sand and these boulders, you have a lot more porosity. There's a lot more room for the the, the water to move between between those boulders, and the boulders boulders can settle at a deeper angle, and 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 because of that. So looking at some of the profiles here, this is Aha Nui Delta on the top left and then the Kapoho on the top right. Let me zoom in so you can see them a little better here. In blue is 2006, the previous topography bathymetry underwater slope. So it wasn't quite as steep. It got quite a bit steeper, you see. Um, and it's pretty consistent. And that's Aha Nui right there. You see it extends offshore um, on the order of two kilometers or so, maybe a little bit more, go from there to there, something like that. Two kilometers is uh, a little over a mile, a little over a mile standing offshore. And they also have these plots in set in here, which are showing the slope, right? So this is the slope at any point in time, any point along there and here, 10 degree slope, 20 degree slope, 30 degree slope. And so you can see that we're at around 15 degree slope and areas and some areas as high as 30 degree slopes with a lot of variation beforehand. And afterwards, we're pretty steadily at 30 degree slope and 20 degree slope for at the very, very farther out section out in here. So it's actually pretty stable at a 30 degree angle, which is something we'll, we'll note later is not what happens at pool. And here's a couple hole where it's thicker. See how thick it is. But, you know, it's pretty thick, even pretty far offshore here. And old bathymetry here and a new material with a st steeper slope here once again as well. So you can see that we are actually increasing our angle repose over previous uh, uh, underwater topography. And everything is still fine. No collapse, no sign of collapse there at all. I did notice a little bit of cracking during eruption, but nothing that eventually led to any collapse. We have a $35 super chat from our friend Gary Bryan. It says, thanks guys for these updates, the analysis and scientific studies, as well as the drones, the drones on 2018 review series provides a fascinating perspective. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Gary. Appreciate the support. Mahalo, Gary. All right, so we'll, we'll keep going. They actually have samples of a lot of these lavas here. Not a lot, but they some samples here. This is a plot that comes mostly from the on-land chemistry of the volcano. So these are Fisher 17 lavas that are more evolved. That's what this means to be on this end of the graph over here. So cooler and more evolved. And towards this end of the graph is hotter and less evolved. So you can see that as the lava coming down was replaced with the hotter highlight mount model lava in a pipeline, we moved towards this end of the graph over here. So um, early phase, late phase, and eventually the latest latest stage stuff uh, was out over here. So um, where these red lines are, 
is where the submarine lavas fall. They fall right there, there, and there. Little window right in here. So consistent with being lava from this eruption that they're actually measuring. And also you can see that that, that it took those later, later phases to get lava that far offshore when they were measuring. Just a little, little bit uh, of a tangent, as is this one as well. A cool thing that they found is areas when this is a, this is a, a cross section um, through the, the lava glass that was collected there. And these long gray shapes, those are feldspar crystals. You can see that they're all over the place. But there's more of them outside this white line, which is iron oxide ring. There's more of them out here than there are in here. And usually crystals grow, you get more of them the longer time passes. The idea being is that this is something that was some chunk of lava that cooled more quickly. Maybe it was a chunk of lava that shot from the, the, the fissure and landed back in a lava channel. Or maybe it was a chunk of the, of the lava itself. So lava was gurgling and gurgling and gurgling on its surface all the way down that eight and a half mile long river of lava. So if one of those chunks of the AA flow had a chance to cool and then go back into the lava, then that's the kind of texture you're preserving in here. And normally, if the lava is cooling on land, it may be that you eventually destroy this, this heat separation in here. You eventually can start um, homogenizing the material. But if they speculate that because this was all frozen underwater, essentially quenched more quickly, that you actually are seeing this, this texture preserved. And this is kind of a novel thing, not something that's been documented a whole lot before. And that's why I thought to include it. In fact, I'm including everything, um, all the images of this paper, because there, there are so many interesting things here. You see that this glass in here with no crystals, right? There and there and there as well. And some alignment as well, when you have um, Perhaps some flow or movement or some, some shear force or something else is happening. Line crystals as well in some of those areas. Interesting aside there, I'll stop with the, the geochemistry here and we'll turn to the Pu'o'o lava deltas, which were also scanned and surveyed when a comparison. So there are two different colors on here. And that's because there are areas that in Pu'o'o, unlike we saw in 2018, where everything was just added on, added on, added on. In the Pu'o'o area, you have some area, areas that are losing material. Essentially, you're having little slumps and slides. So you're losing material from areas farther upslope, and you're adding material to areas further downslope. Sometimes when you actually have a big collapse on land, then you get a big, big fan like that as well. So... The two biggest collapses on land, East Laiapuki, 2007, I believe, was 34 acres. Momoa, 2016, was 44 acres of land collapsing. That's just a very, very on-land chunk of it. So there's a whole um, buttress of sediment below that that has to fail, and it's that whole chunk moving. When you see the top move in that much, then some big chunk of the bottom had to, had to have moved to, to go off. And this is all small-scale stuff. Um, nothing that would cause um, tsunami, but something that would cause acoustic signals that are, are, have been documented um, underwater in the past through microphones. On Luihi, in fact. So um, let's dig into the pool a little bit more before we wrap it up here. So a couple, a couple of cross sections in the pool area here, and you can see that there are some areas where in blue is the previous topography. In 2018, we have an addition of sediment here, but it's pretty thin, and it does extend similar distances far offshore, but very, very thin compared to what we saw uh, from Kapoho. And the certain sections you can see here, here is that area where in 2006 it was actually higher and then lower, and so we remove material from here, get down to the red line, and we deposited it over here. And here's where these um, slope graphs can be useful. And so you can see here that um, the blue line around 15 degree slope and then coming near shore that slope increased to around 20 degrees. After the fact you can see that the slope is 15 degrees 
steady across the entire thing. So we were over steepened from lava coming into the ocean um, from that pool eruption there. And that's what allowed it to then slide over to the side. Um, looking at the other area here, you can see that even where it is steeper, it's still following the previous topography more or less. And so some regions can, can sustain steeper angles, 20 degrees up here, for example, and others just um, cannot and will slide away. That's a little bit of the, the details of the that lava delta here. This is an interesting plot here. And um, Kapoho on top, 2006 in green, 2018 in blue. Um, Pu'o'o on the bottom here. And more or less, this, is, this heat map is showing you the slope on the bottom compared to the depth, right? So you can see that essentially the deeper you got in Kapoho, the shallower the slope is how it used to be before the eruption. And since the eruption, you can see that no matter what depth you're at, we're pretty close to 30 degree slope all the way across nowadays, right? So we went from having it be a little bit more, a little bit more curved perhaps, right? So now it's a big, big flat ramp out there. Right, that's that's uh, so that's essentially our max. We pushed it to the max as far as we could, and that's as much as we could fit out offshore over there, is, is how it looks right there. And pool in comparison, you see a lot more spread in the data back in 2006 because there's a little lower quality data set, but you can basically see that uh, similar, you see that kind of curved distribution there, and that is the same 2018. So we didn't actually change the baseline at pool at all, we're essentially working with it. And Kapoho is changing it uh, irregard, uh, out regard for what was there beforehand. What was is evolving. That slope is evolving at a similar at a, at a slower rate, and that is allowing it to be constrained by that pre-existing slope. And I say slower rate because um, ultimately uh, they calculated that during the twelve years of activity in this area there was 500 million cubic meters of magma put into the ocean 500 million now in comparison for the three months of 2018 we were somewhere around 700 plus cubic million cubic meters of lava into the ocean so what we can say is that even though the eruption in 2018 was a lot shorter than those 12 years of Pu'o'o. It put out more lava underwater, right? We're talking about just underwater now. It put out more lava into the ocean in those three months than it did the entire previous 12 years of Pu'o'o, right? So that's a whole order of magnitude faster. So the lava is going in a lot faster. And the idea is that when that's happening, you minimize interaction of lava and water at this interface right in here, right? The interface, um, you have lava still interacting with seawater, but you have a much larger interior of the flow that's allow, uh, able to go to much deeper depths to erupt. You can certainly have explosions from offshore or underwater that can come up um, through the water, not right by the shoreline, but a little bit offshore, as was the case in the, the tour boat accident in 2018 in July. Um, whereas when you have lava going into the ocean slower, like in a pool era, then it's essentially interact, more of it is interacting with this interface. So you're getting more of it shattering and forming that sandy material. When you have sandy material, now it's, it's able to slide more easily because it's not, um, not bigger chunks. It's, you know, when you, when you have big blocks, it's like, you know, you know, the, like when you're, if anyone has kids and your kids are playing with building blocks, right? You can, you can get big angular blocks and stack them pretty steep angles, right? And if you have smaller blocks and like, you know, imagine like, uh, you know, um, salt. Salt is actually little cubes, right? If you look at the mineral structure of salt, it's like a tiny, tiny little cube. You try to pile up salt, it's hard to make a giant stack of salt. It, it has a natural angle of repose, right? That's, that's, um, that's, uh, uh less of a slope than the bigger blocks and the same thing is true with sand and big blocks of lava for example so it's partly because of that that grain size right um the size of the sediment dictating 
that you're able to have this movement and you can have landslides run out. And landslides, even though they're going down less steep slopes, 15 to 20 degrees in pool era, um, because of the, of the composition of it, it can go out a lot larger distance, a lot longer distance offshore. And the ones that happened in 2018 would only go a little ways because the blocks would just tumble, 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 and then just land, and that's the new spot. It doesn't have to keep going. It's not a, a fine sediment that's going to keep going out and out and out for over a mile offshore. So the landslides end up being, being shorter. You end up having a steeper slope offshore. And the other thing, as noted early on, intact lava flows down at the very bottom of this thing. If lava is intact, intact in the middle of the stack and it's not all just loose debris, Right, then it can also be perhaps more internally uh, uh, strong, right? Although there is some argument there as well, because possibly those intact flows could be pathways for fluids or other things, and there's some complication there as well. We won't get into won't get into here. But um, essentially, the answer then is is because the lava was going in faster in 2018, uh, it was able to embed coherent flows that went down to great depths. It was able to break apart into bigger blocks, and that allowed it to have a steeper slope. And as a result, not a single collapse in 2018, unlike in Pool. Right? And so this is inter interesting to note, and I'm sure there'll be more research in the future because they, this is very important as far as hazard assessment, right? If you're worried about, this was a question during 2018 eruption, is the lava delta gonna collapse or not? then now you might know an important thing to look for is the size of the sediment that's uh, uh, collecting offshore. And that may have to do with the kind of lava that you have, right? Ah uh, deltas have, have been, sh been documented elsewhere to have to be different than Pahoy Hoi deltas. It might depend on exactly, exactly why, right? You know, an Ah uh, flow is different from, from Pahoy Hoi and often having less gas, so less porosity within it. And it can have more crystals as well. And it was reported that this flow in 2018 going into, into as we just saw, just saw uh, from those thin sections, um, going to the ocean here, the lava was very crystal rich already. Crystal rich and gas poor. Um, so maybe, maybe that um, had an effect as well, right? That internal um, strength from being more crystal rich and having less bubbles in it uh, makes it harder to break the rock. That, that um, as well, and of course, uh, that depends on the flux, how much lava is coming out of the ground. And usually, when you have a lot coming out, it often comes out as uh uh. So, some interesting correlations there, and you know, um, we'll see what happens. Lava goes in, in the ocean in the future, wherever it may be. You know, it can be different styles, right? Um, in Mauna Loa, lava has gone in the ocean without any explosions in the past, it's gone in the ocean and caused explosions in the past. We've had Build deltas, not build deltas. You can get any different style, and we're still working out the details of it. Um, so that. Right, right. Well, that was really good. Thank you, Phil, for going through those papers. Um, I believe we we showed the one that we have access to. The other two are kind of behind paywalls right now, um, which we don't have access to. We'd like to bring you that kind of content. But as of right now, cost prohibitive. Um, let's dive into some questions, huh? We have one really good one here if you're ready yeah um actually this is like an aggregation of three questions that we're going to turn into two questions but it's all about uh continued collapse at the summit one second okay so david asks um do we have to worry about the additional summit collapses in the say you know next couple of years um that could expand and consume the visitor center or the Jagger Museum. We'll go with the Jagger um, and potentially compromise Highway 11. Um, for a collapse to compromise Highway 11 and the visitor center, it would have to be, be on a high end, a large side of collapses, right? Because even the 2018 collapse didn't do that. And um, that was big for our lifetimes for sure. There have been, you know, there are cracks beyond that that we think go back to to the powers caldera, the great caldera that's back maybe two thousand years ago or so, right? Um, 
it would have to be have to be a really big one for that to happen you would have to have the magma leaving the area again so it would have to go go out one of the rift zones to the southwest or down to the lower east rift again so if magma were to you know uh find its way to the lower east rift again you might might deal with collapses at that point right now there's no indication of that happening there could certainly be smaller collapses um not of a size that would that we have to worry about it consuming those areas um if we get to that point, we'll have other things we're worried about first, like lava going down one of the rifts to some further area to cause a collapse in the first place. So uh, we're not, I'm not worried about that at this point in time, and, you know, and that would certainly be an unusual event, right? Even the collapse that we did get to see in 2018 wasn't right. that big. Uh, just to expand upon that, M. Ice was asking about, um, so we're talking about potential activity in the Upper East Rift Zone. And even uh, say we have an eruption very similar to the one we just had, but it was to take place on the Upper East Rift Zone. Would that be able to continue uh, to put us back into a cycle of collapse, further collapse? Um, so the, I mean, what, what it comes down to in the end is the collapse. It's it's a it's a net calculation of volume, right? So you have to remove the volume from the summit somehow. You can do that by moving it down one of, the, one of the rift zones to erupt somewhere, right? And so if you moved it to the upper east rift zone, that certainly could satisfy that southwest rift zone the same. But it's not just you have an eruption there. It has to be enough volume that you can then cause a collapse at the summit. So it's not just, okay, it popped in the east rift zone for one or two days, but it kept going for a while enough to cause enough volume to leave to cause a collapse. So we'd have to have an eruption ongoing for a while for that to happen. And right. um, we'd have to have to, of course, see that first. Um, certainly, there have been eras of Kilauea where it has collapsed multiple times in the century, right? In the eighteen hundreds, especially, right? We talk about eighteen thirty-two, three, sixty-eight, um, There was another one, seven. Um, but anyways, right. multiple multiple ones in a century, and if you know if if you were to have a south flank affecting things and moving to create space underground, that's another way you can remove volume from the summit is by moving the south flank, and of course right, and... that may or may not lead to that magma going to the rift zone, and may or may not lead to an eruption, but it could do that without that just by moving the south flank. Right. Just to add those 1800 uh, collapses that you were speaking on, those weren't as big as this one. This one was a pretty big collapse, but the big collapse, the real big one was the one that formed the caldera itself, the, the main caldera that we see at Kilauea Summit. And the just what we what we ex, uh, suspect is associated with that, uh, the, the features in the Lower East Rift Zone, like the Kapoho Crater or the, uh, the, the pit craters behind... Uh, uh Hanalo street i can't remember the name of them right now um, yeah the pit crater is more so than puukapoho has got a, a longer weirder unique weirder, yeah. history yeah but you know but a lot like of the pit craters Paul's... yeah per perhaps so yeah um it's we don't know a whole lot about those uh, the details of some right. of those of those 1800 collapses right you know some of the maps is that we, maps that we have the color of floor um jump across more than one collapse so you, it's hard to really know I, I believe that some of them may have been bigger than 2018 in fact oh, where really? it, it wasn't just the western part of the caldera floor but the western and the central and the eastern part of the caldera floor of all were all low and of course the whole configuration was different before then right you know right. Where, the, where the shallow chamber might have been for example might have been slightly different so um it's hard to compare there's not, not enough data but right um You'd have to have, you know, to, for that to happen, you need a lot of change in the south flank, likely, and likely that affects something in the rifts as well. So it doesn't happen by itself without something else triggering it first, um, to the best of our understanding at this point in time. Uh, we got one more here. I'm going to go with that one, uh, finish it up with. Bill asks, has the new shoreline eroded uh, due to the, the waves, the tidal actions? taking place there i have not done a survey i don't have any information to really, really show you know um i think anecdotally we have heard that there have been some small collapses along the sea cliff there yeah. but um anything you can share there's 
There's been a few. Um, it is, you know, I would say it is eroding and that rock is getting pushed into Poiki more and more. So when we started out, the sediment we were seeing there was mostly sand. So everybody's like, oh, it's a sandy beach. Over the past year, it's been mostly rock and rocks that are getting bigger in size or just it's 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 now rock beach. Um, do, and then like that's just the erosion coming from the, the cliffs getting washed in uh, with the tidal forces in there. So, but it's the interesting thing is between this what we're seeing and say something like 1960 when the the ocean entry there because if you go along that from the ocean side it's sheer cliff now like 10 foot 20 foot just sheer vertical cliffs all the way around. So, are we going to get to something like that potentially? Yeah, that's certainly what we would expect. Yeah, and it's an interesting point right up there, right? You know, we we talked about how this offshore Nautilus study. Didn't see any sand anywhere, but we saw a whole bunch of sand at Pohuiki, right? And we're not seeing it anymore. So, you know, we certainly know that there was some sand there. And I think probably it was generated during that uh, eruption as well when lava, you know, there certainly was an interaction of lava and seawater and there was sand produced. And maybe that sand along with that other ashy stuff has stayed suspended in a water column and didn't make it down to those depths and kind of got, got pushed away, right? Um, yeah. To Pohuiki. The point being, you know, um, only because we've been um, talking to the community and talking about the restoration of Pohuiki boat ramp and the movement of sediment and all that, right? It's important that we realize that there was a big pulse of sediment generated during the eruption that is no longer the case. And so even though we have rock coming and moving and depositing and shifting around, the right. production rate is not nearly what it was during the eruption, um, yeah. what we're seeing now. So rocks are still moving, but it's not like it's... Um, moving in so quickly like it did during right. that eruption right afterwards right you know that that it's not that it's uh uh it's, it's essentially it's it's a much slower rate um that we're seeing now then right it just makes getting in the water really difficult because there's no more like oh i can walk down here barefoot and not worry about the you know stepping on something that that's that's not a thing anymore um along yeah. just the, the water edge but yeah, um, I believe that does it for questions. If we didn't get to your questions, we uh, apologize. There is one last one about are they going to rebuild the ramp? They, the new plan is to dredge it, and we will be doing an update on that. When I get it from the engineers, um, they're going to be making a mock-up that we're going to share. And yeah, it's, we, we got to preview it yesterday, kind of the new plan or the latest version of it. And it is quite interesting, and it is somewhat of a change from what we were talking about previously. But we'll ex we'll explain that a little more when we have a little bit more information about uh, you know the, it getting designed a little bit further. Right, it's not imminent because because there's a whole process with FEMA and all of that. So we'll, right. we still have time to get all that to you guys. It's going to unfortunately take a while. Right. So, right. so yeah, my, we got plenty of time. <laughs> all right, thank you, Phil. Yeah, 2018 is what we we just we wanted to focus on a little bit, just kind of you know re recap some of the science here. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Dane is, does have a drones on video coming up um, after yep. we finish your live today. That kind of continues that that pattern. Um, so tune into that. And otherwise, we'll be back with you guys in a week on Thursday and bring you guys Mauna Loa and Kilauea update once again. Um, we'll still try to catch up in the comments. If you guys uh, didn't get questions answered and you're really itching for it, you know, um, drop it on YouTube, drop it on Facebook. Um, may not get to it immediately, but we'll get get eventually uh, to the questions there as well. And it helps if you tag us as well. Uh, one extra attention that way. So mahalo, you guys. Mahalo for your interaction today. Mahalo for your, your good questions. Um, Thank you guys for uh, our, for supporting us. Uh, thank you to all our sponsors and to all your small donors who really are a huge percentage of what this is going. So, anything else you want to add, Dane, before we sign off here and switch over to drones on? Nope, just yeah, drones on. It will premiere um, after this live stream. Give it maybe five minutes, but it will be there, and I'll be in chat as well. You know, answer any questions and discuss. You know. Some of the changes of that day we're going to be covering may 22nd and 23rd so we're looking at some perch ponds we're looking at uh some breakouts along the lava channel and a new lava channel trying to make its way down to the ocean so yep that'll be in drones on which we're right after this yeah so yeah we'll yeah, we'll get to that shortly um 
one just last plug for Hawaii Tracker, HawaiiTracker.com. Check it out here. You know, um, those of you guys who are planning to come to Hawaii or in Hawaii, uh, one article that's up there I forgot to mention earlier, Ui Kahuna, the Overlook by Jagger Museum, has reopened to the public yesterday. You can't go to the, the rock wall area. is still closed. But you can go over here to this high mark um, to the west or to Overlook to the east or, or to the overlook to the west over there and get a get a similar view into the crater as was available so visitations high if you guys are planning on a visit you can now update walk a little further and a parking lot's open so um this mass of visitors to the to the island and the park can spread out a little bit more some more bathrooms as well all that's appreciated at some point uh Give you guys more updates of what's happening in the park here but just to just to mention that keep an eye on hawaiitracker.com we'll find some more nuggets like that all right so of course this is the link here between 2021 and 2018 that we're ending with in this in this view here well, hello everybody thanks for joining for dan dupont i'm philip ong aloha <laughs>